Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 22nd of May. I'm Robert Barwick. And I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Hello, Craig. Yeah, hi, Robbie. In today's Citizens Report, people power beat the cash ban, a people's bank can save the country, and fight the foreign influence operation pushing Australia to war with Russia and China. Before we get into it, I just want to mention the, this publication, the Australian Alert Service, which is the weekly magazine of the Citizens Party. What we cover in the show is elaborated in here. We can't ever do it justice in the show because of the time limit. So if you haven't received a copy of this before, you feel free to call in on our toll-free number and ask for a copy, and we'll, one will be sent out to you and you can see what we do in it. Um, because what we've done with this publication and, and everything else we've done is actually um, paying off big time. So today's news is good news. People power can beat the cash ban, a people's bank can save the country. And Craig, we are declaring a qualified victory on the cash ban because um, good sources and more than one have um, reported back that the government is dropping the bill. And Robbie, that's because you know we've had six, 2,600 people yep. took the time out to write a submission to the, the committee that was investigating this, and it absolutely created shockwaves throughout the political establishment because they, they said, "Holy hell!" You know, ordinary people are mobilising yep. on, and they're not hysterical. They're not going out in the street protesting. These are ordinary people saying, "Listen, this is not good enough. We don't want this." And the politicians listened. They had to listen. They had that, no choice. That's right. They were they were inundated from the public in a way they're not used to, really. And I think um, there's some relief from the receptionists and the electoral officers I'm not sure. having to field calls from our supporters. I'm sure there others. is. So a special mention to John Adams, the economist, who played a really important role leading the campaign. Martin North on his show, um, and he and John do the Interest of the People show, and then Martin has his Walk the World show, got the message out. Um, uh, other people that brought it to our attention, like Helen Edwards, who brought it to our attention the first time. And if you know the story, Helen was tipped off by someone in North Africa, right, online because the government had released its intention for this bill late on a Friday evening and Helen was tipped off from him. From him, Helen Edwards calls John Adams, John Adams calls me, and we started to make a, a big campaign about it. And But the main thing was, we're not, I can tell you, we're not taking all the credit. It really is the people who prepared to get involved, right? And there was a flood of um, initial submissions to the to the to the t treasury, which they tried to bury, right, and that, that led to another revolt, flood of submissions to the Senate inquiry, and um, now we're at this point where that's that's the indication we're getting. Now, look, some people will say, "Oh, are you sure? Are you sure?" Well, um, you know, we, there will be sometime in the future a formal announcement, or, or maybe even not a formal announcement. The government will just withdraw it from the the legis You know, you'll see that that'll become quite obvious then, but. We can't hang around and wait for that. It's like um, it's like you know Douglas MacArthur didn't wait to to defeat every single Japanese soldier on every island when they fought in World War One. They just made sure they won the main battle and kept going to to get to Tokyo as fast as they could, right? And as you know, Craig, um, some of these Japanese soldiers were coming out of the jungle surrendering 30, 30 years later, not knowing the war had ended, <laughs> right? But it well and truly ended. So um, uh, we, we're confident that yes, this has now been um, defeated. Right? We will watch it like a hawk, though, mark my words, and we will make a huge deal of it if, if it comes up again. Um, but for the, for the time being, this is a victory to you, the viewer. And with that in mind, that's why we want to emphasise where we're going now. Right? Because it's one thing to stop bad policies, but it's another thing to actually change the direction of the country for the good, introduce good policies. And one of the things that we tried to make clear from the beginning, the, the, the main reason we opposed the cash ban aside from the, the uh, civil liberties aspect, aspect was this was an attempt to trap us into the banking system to avoid reform of the banking system, right? Because it, unreformed, more and more people are going to exit the banking system. It's so bad. So we've got, we've, got, we're, we've got ideas for reforming the banking system, sound policies like Glass-Steagall to break up the banks, and a national bank, a public bank institution, because whatever a future banking system looks like, it needs to be separated from speculation, it needs to be regulated, and there needs to be a role for the government because it can do different things that private banks can't do, more long-term investment. Right. So to that end... Yeah, we put together an actual manual on this with yes. all the detailed material that people need and they can 
get a copy of that from our organisation. I mean, this is an in-depth legislative program, which is, you know, which is ready to run. Yeah. Right. Well, so before we go to the break, Craig, I want to announce the next thing we've done this week is we have launched a new petition. Now, we launched one recently um, on a national bank. Problem is we decided that was too general. This is a specific petition on this policy proposal that's being picked up in Parliament now to take the existing institution we've got in Australia, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, and expand it into a proper national development bank that can do a lot more than just clean energy technology. So here's the petition. We'll put the text on the screen for you. Fast track Australia to economic recovery and prosperity. Expand the CEFC into a national development bank. To the Honourable, the Speaker and members of the House of Representatives. This petition of concerned Australians draws to the attention of the House that millions of Australians are suddenly out of work due to the coronavirus shutdown of an economy already struggling under record foreign and household debt and excessively concentrated in financial and real estate speculation, raw materials exports, tourism and foreign education. Many regional communities were already devastated by bushfire and drought. There is no guarantee that all these lost jobs will snap back when public health restrictions are lifted. Australia has immense potential for economic development in both the major cities and regions that would produce real wealth from expanded manufacturing and agricultural production. Investing in this potential through new infrastructure, industrial development and training will upgrade the economy and create millions of jobs directly and indirectly. The government's existing investment institution, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, could be expanded into a national development bank for this purpose. As well as supporting clean energy technology, it could invest in water, power, transportation and high-speed rail infrastructure and in new industries, including through loans to federal, state and local government agencies for desperately needed public projects and to entrepreneurs to initiate and expand industrial production. We therefore ask the House to amend the Clean Energy Finance Corporation Act 2012 to expand the CEFC into a powerful national development bank to revive and transform the economy and create jobs and prosperity both now and for the future. So that's the petition. Please go to the website and sign it and share it, right, as widely as possible. This is going to be um, a key part of the campaign. The next three weeks, there is a, there is a push in three weeks' time to get a bill to do this in par introduced in Parliament by Bob Catter, right? And signing this petition now and sharing it, getting as much support on it as possible, will help add to the, the, um, the, the pressure on the politicians to make that happen, right? So let's take a break because when we, when we come back, Craig and I are going to talk about the historical role our, ex our former government bank, the Commonwealth Bank, did in rescuing and helping local councils develop, which is really, really important right now. Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing people power beat the cash ban, a people's bank can save the country. So now we want to talk about what a people's bank did, and we're going to use examples from World War I and just afterwards with the Commonwealth Bank, because the Commonwealth Bank started in um, 1912. Uh, right now, Craig, there's a huge problem, though, in local councils around Australia, right? Mm. So yeah. they're incredibly vulnerable. They were already on their net, as the petition I read through said, you know, if the, the, the ones in the areas with... Uh, drought, but especially the bushfires that came on the back of the drought. And then the tourism has been crushed by the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Yeah. They're struggling to, they're, they're all looking at, at, at um, uh, going extinct. Because, look, Robbie, the, the councils get their income from rates. Yep. And if you've got businesses that have gone out of business, there's no rates and they can't pay, you know, and this is the problem. So, I mean, the precedent's really clear in our history, and we're very lucky that we've had actually had the, the old Commonwealth Bank as a precedent for a national bank. Because in 1912, you know, the, national, the Commonwealth Bank lent effectively about 10% of Australia's GDP. It was £9.36 million pound into local councils. You know, today's standards, that would be something like $200 billion. Now, that means that that money could be filtered out to all the different councils yep. to do all the non-sexy uh, infrastructure programs that need to be done, like rebuilding sewage treatment plants. And 
I don't know how many, uh, you know, how much infrastructure was destroyed by the fire, but I can bet you it was a lot Plenty, in yeah. these local councils in in the bushfire area. So they need to repair that infrastructure, and this means jobs, real productive jobs, producing things for the community, and these pro these these projects would be, you know, basically self-funding. In other words, they will eliminate any sort of. Uh, funding put into it, but we pay back over time. And Craig, what they also need though, right, is new industries, like bringing Absolutely. their industries back. So I, um, uh, a few weeks ago, Craig and I did a, a segment on a little bit of the history of the, where the Citizens Party came from. And for me personally, I got involved in politics when uh, Craig was in, Fraser, in uh, Harvey Bay and I was in Childers in Queensland, and they're both near Fraser Island. They shut down sand mining on Fraser Island. And there were big protests, and I was a young teenager, and this was rather electrifying. Uh, I, found I found politics became much more interesting than accounting I was supposed to be studying. <laughs> um, uh, but I remember at the time, the community was told, you can have tourism. And then you go all around Australia, and either for environmental reasons or neoliberal reasons, like free trade. I remember John Elliott, when he took over Elders IXL, he went and shut down canneries all over the country that elders used to own that process fruit locally in, the, in South Australia and in Tasmania, all over the place. And all those, you know, um, where, where communities lost their industries, they were told, oh, you can have tourism, right? Um, pork produce, you know, when, they, when the pork producers were put out of business by pork imports, oh, you can have tourism, you can have tourism. Logging, when logging was shut down, oh, you can have tourism, you can have tourism. So we've got a country that's become dependent on tourism. Well, tourism doesn't create wealth. It moves it from somewhere else to where you are. Someone else has to create the wealth, right? Then it makes you very vulnerable to a, a pandemic like this, a global financial crisis or a war, right? It's a real vulnerable way to run an economy. So somehow we've got to get the industries back. And that's what the Commonwealth Bank did in this lending that you talk about. So Because it was focused on the physical economy, Robbie, the, of, of actual exactly. production. And I think what we have, I just want to say this because you come across it all the time because there's a little, starting to be a bit of blowback from what uh, Morrison's done with spending all this money in the economy. Okay, they're, they're, they're jobs that, uh, you know, not essential jobs, like they're actually service sector jobs. They're not actually productive jobs. I mean, they're important jobs, but they're yeah. not productive. They're important to the people who have them. But that's, 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 that's correct. Right. The problem is that we've had 40 years, Robbie, of this policy of economic rationalism where the idea is you have an elite a bunch of corporations or bankers that say, oh no, we're going to grab whatever we can, we're going to privatise whatever we can, and we're going to steal that which belongs to the people. So we've had a lot of infrastructures literally being stolen and transferred. And then they say, oh no, but we can't get involved in manufacturing because we don't have a comparative advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People have to realise that in historical terms, that comparative advantage comes from the same free trade ideology that gave us slave trading and opium trading of the British East India Company. So there's a long history here of policies that Australia is adopting that come from this idea of slave trading and, and yeah. uh, opium production. And, and, and this we re our economy today is actually the fruits of the thinking of people in yesteryear who didn't think that way. Exactly. Who actually made I mean, If you go back and look at Curtin and Chifley and what they did during the war, it was all focused on physical economy. Right? I mean, that's, what, that's how we in the Citizens Party think. And that's why we have this brilliant opportunity with the CEFC to take that, remodel it slightly, not change it completely, in the own, uh, yeah. but actually expand it, and then start to say, oh, let's emit large amounts of credit so that we can put people into high paying, good jobs that, the, that, that, that leave something behind. Because real, look, creating credit is different than printing money, and it's important that people know this. When we're talking about creating credit, we're creating credit to issue into the economy for the future. At the end of the day, there's gonna be something left that is going to benefit the community, whether it be bridges or roads or something that will increase the physical uh, capacity of the nation. It makes the economy work better. We're not printing money that goes into a bank that yeah. goes into speculation. Yeah. And that's a, there's a huge difference here. One is got the creation of credit has to do with developing the future and visions and imagination, which is exactly what the Commonwealth Bank was excellent at funding, as opposed to the idea of you've got to give us money so that we can put it in our bank and we can invest it in speculation and, and pile it up where money becomes useless and it becomes very, very destructive to the economy as a whole. Well, let's read this list of what the Commonwealth Bank did invest in in its first decade, 19, basically 1912 to 1923, in the council sphere, just for councils at the time, right? As Craig said, something like 10% of GDP. There was £2.83 million for road, bridges, drainage and other permanent improvements. 
1.26 million pounds for gas and electric light, 400,000 pounds for tramways. Now, Robbie, we should have train level crossing removals in there for today. I agree. I mean, look at the amount it, of time you waste. It makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. Um, and then uh, council chambers, sanitation, harbour improvements and other miscellaneous. And some of the projects that came out of this first official history of the Commonwealth Bank include they electrified the St George... The Commonwealth Bank paid to electrify the St George District of New South Wales, a hydroelectric scheme on the Nimboida River, um, which is a tribute to the Clarence River in northern New South Wales to power Grafton and the Clarence Valley, road construction in the Meriden Shire in Western Australia in the wheat belt because all these soldier settlers had settled there and so they built them roads to help them get their wheat to market, right? A new larger moorable bridge between Bannockburn and Maud in Victoria, road upgrades in Tintinbar Shire, New South Wales to facilitate dairy production, New concrete roads in North Sydney, Brisbane and Townsville. I was born in Townsville. I'm from Townsville originally. You can still see those concrete roads today. The expansion of Newcastle's electric power plant to supply the increasing production from BHP's Newcastle steel mill and the growing population of the city, as well as they funded a municipal abattoir for the city. Hydroelectricity projects in Tasmania, which kick-started Tasmania big time in that direction. Sewerage in Ballarat, Bendigo and Geelong. Improved drainage in Rainbow and Japarit in Victoria. And if you don't know where that is, Japarit is where Sir Robert Menzies was born. <laughs> Firefighting facilities in Western Australia and a new electric plant and electrification of street lighting in Perth and much more. And what, right. Robert, today we've got two major projects that could be funded, which we write about in the Australian Alert Service. You've got the whole Bradfield scheme. Yeah. You know, build the Hell's Gate Dam, as Bob, uh, Bob Cat has been talking about. Now, they're ready to go. Yep. Get into them, right? And these will produce huge amounts of uh, jobs, but also transform the environment in a good way to provide more water for the interior of Australia. And secondly, you've got the high-speed train proposal that Al Anthony Albanese has been pretty keen on. Um, Which we have as a colour feature, Craig, in this week's issue yeah. of the Alert Service, reminding people what the ver very fast, original very fast train proposal was, and it's full colour, great pictures there. It's really impressive what it was. It was only political will that stopped it. And now, we, you know, if we want an economy, we need to start was, doing those sort of things. I was things. talking about the future, Robbie. Now, just people go back and think about Sydney without the Sydney Harbour Bridge or the tunnel. Yep. How constricted would Sydney be? It would be nightmares. But that piece of infrastructure transformed the entirety of Sydney. What if we had a high-speed train system all the way from, you know, from Melbourne all the way up through to Brisbane as has been proposed? And the plans are already been done in yep. detail, actually. That will transform the Eastern Corridor of Australia and provide enormous opportunities for new industries, yep. new jobs and so Including forth. Including decentralised regional development, which exactly. is crucial. Yep. Craig, we're going to take a break. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, fight the foreign influence operation pushing Australia to war with Russia and China. And this is getting very, very serious, this issue. So what I want to highlight is there's a gang of juvenile politicians in Parliament, and they are juveniles. They call themselves the Wolverines. They're a little pack. They leave stickers of claw marks around Parliament House on doors and walls, right? Because they're cool. Um, it's bipartisan. It's got Labor and Liberal members. The Labor one is Kimberly Kitching. The Liberal one are people like Andrew Hastie and um, James Patterson. This pack of Wolverines, named after a paranoid 1984 um, movie called Red Dawn where a gang of teenagers fight the Russian takeover of America. Um, they claim that they formed to protect Australian sovereignty. But have a look at this image here. This was in the, the Australian newspaper. Last week, these clowns inducted the United States ambassador as an honorary member of their pack. What on earth does the United States ambassador have to do with protecting Australian sovereignty? The issue here is these people define Australia's national interest as America's national interest. And that's the problem. And I've quoted it a thousand times on the show. Craig remembers we used to talk to Malcolm Fraser in his final years and he said Australia is not an independent country. We've always been subservient to the United Kingdom and now the United States and we don't have our own independence, and that's our problem. And he came up with this saying, Australia needs the United States for security, but we only need security because we're allied to the United States. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Malcolm Fraser said. I want to point out, Kimberly Kitching is a notorious tweeter. She tweets everything she does. She didn't tweet this photo, right? That was in the Australian newspaper. These people, they, they define 
our future as what America says it is. And that's why we're opposed to them. And I have to point them out because these are the people, this is the anti-China gang in Parliament. This, these guys in that photo, they are the anti-China gang. So what, what they're doing now is they're currently pushing for an Australian Magnitsky Act. Now Magnitsky Act is for targeted sanctions against officials in foreign governments. But what it does, it weaponizes human rights. Right? In other words, so we can point to someone and say, they're a human rights abuser. And there's an American um, State Department memo to Rex Tillerson in 2017 where they said blatantly, we only use this against our adversaries, never against our friends. So for instance, they don't target Russia, uh, sorry, they don't target Saudi Arabia, which chops people's heads off, right? But it's always Russia, China and, and Syria and countries like that. Um, so last Friday night, there was a hearing in the parliament on this Magnitsky Act. The idea came from this clown, this, this hedge fund billionaire named Bill Browder, who's a front for HSBC, which is a real criminal bank. Um, we're going to put a link below. I don't have time to go through the details, but he, he, there's a, we're going to put a link below to a documentary that's currently up on YouTube that keeps getting taken down, though. It's called The Magnitsky Act Behind the Scenes, which exposes everything Browder says. But basically, he says that this guy, Magnitsky, that after the act is named us after, uh, it was, was arrested by the Russians and they tortured and killed him in prison. And, and he came up with this idea of an act to be able to uh, put sanctions on those individual members of the Russian government, right? Um, we made submissions to this inquiry. A, a, a top investigative reporter in America named Lucy Commissar did as well. Our submission was printed. Hers wasn't, um, and, uh, or not yet. Um, but Bill Browder responded to our submission, Craig, saying that uh, he accused us of being part of the Russian government's campaign against him, right? Yeah. On the day before the hearing, we put out a press release which you can read in this um, alert service as well. Parliament must demand answers from liar Bill Browder. And we'd, the focus of the press release was to point out the three cases in Europe where Browder's story has been dismissed by proper European institutions. First, the European um, Court on Human Rights. This was September last year. The Danish Press Board, and then most recently the German Press Council, in the case of latter two, they, latter two, they upheld um, articles that were written exposing Browder that Browder had complained about, right? So at least they showed, and they should have showed the Australian members of parliament, there's something really dodgy about this guy's story. And people can, like I said, click on the link and watch the documentary yourself while it's still up on um, uh, YouTube. But did the members of parliament ask those questions of Bill Browder? No, it was a love fest with Bill Browder and Amal Clooney and Jeffrey Robertson and, and sort of like the human rights weaponising brigade at the moment. And don't think we're not for human rights. What we're telling you, what they say about human rights is fake. This is fake human rights weaponising. That's why we're going after it. But what Browder did reveal in that hearing is that um, this is now a five eyes operation, Craig. Australia is being expected to come in with this thing so we can have this we weaponizing human rights system and, and target countries for war effectively, right? Now, I was going to play a video, ran out of time, but I just want to, I just want to uh, describe it. Last Sunday afternoon, a, 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 top, a former National Security American who's in Australia, is a former National Security Council official named Jason Israel, gave a, an interview on Sky News where he said in that interview that in the future, it looks like Australia will be asked by the United States to host nuclear weapons here. Right? This is where this is going. And if we host nuclear weapons in Australia, we're drawing a great big fat target on ourselves. And is that the kind of country, this is how far down the road it's come for, by these people who are telling you China's bad, but they're defining our future with the United States all the way. Right? And that's why we have to blow the whistle on it. Have a look at the links. But we're running out of time. Call in for a copy of this if you haven't got one for more information. And Craig, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Robbie.